War affects medicine in many ways. It spreads disease. It causes casualties. It stops research and takes doctors and nurses away from civilians. It also leads to new medical inventions and ways of working. This programme looks at surviving records from the First World War, fought between 1914 and 1918, which resulted in 24 million casualties, both soldiers and civilians. Did the war help or hinder medicine? We work for hours and hours without rest, moving from stretcher to stretcher. The overcrowding beggars belief. Between the stretchers, the walking wounded slump, waiting patiently for their wounds to be dressed or for a shot of anti-tetanus. Sometimes a man on a stretcher vomits explosively, spewing over himself and his neighbors. Sometimes they die in their stretchers, and we're so busy we don't discover them for hours. In the First World War, doctors and nurses were needed as never before. For many men and women, the war was an opportunity to practice as doctors, nurses and ambulance drivers in the very worst conditions. Captain Lawrence Gameson was a medical officer in the Army Medical Corps. He wrote a diary recording his experiences. work by candlelight. The air is bad. There is blood everywhere. There is little water. No running water, of course. Dressings and filth pile up. We can do so little. We just bandage them up, hand out cups of tea, and give them painkillers if they're screaming. There are so many wounded. We hardly scrape the surface. It was sometimes said the huge number of casualties from battles led to improvements in medicine, especially in surgery. This is what the official history, written at the request of the British government, said about it. The number of battle casualties during the war gave the surgeons a great opportunity for surgical work. And as the years went on, the improvements in method and the skill acquired in dealing with wounds placed war surgery in a position which it had never occupied in the past. But Gameson's diary gives us a different view of how successful surgery was at the front. Sit down, man. You look terrible. I'm fine, fine. Frontline medical officers like Gameson weren't there to carry out operations. Their job was to patch up casualties by bandaging as best they could before sending them back to surgical hospitals, some of which were 20 miles behind the lines, well away from the fighting. But in many cases, surgery would come too late. You look like you need it. Uh, I've just had Corporal Peters through. Do you, do you know Peters? He's a regular rocks. He just lay there asking, would he play again? Play? Uh, football. He's good. Surprisingly nimble for such a large man. Well, was. I um, cut away the dead flesh, but there's nothing to stop the gangrene. So, we'll just send him back down the line, by which time it'd be too late and the leg will have to go. They could have saved it. Not now. What 
was it? Um, bullet. Went in the back of the thigh, smashed the bone at the front. There's a hole three inches thick. <laughs> Maggots swarming already. Couldn't even get the poor sop a shot of tetanus without hurting him more than needles are so blunt. Shh, shh. I mean, do you not think they've suffered enough without us skewering them with blunt needles? Shh. Get some sleep. Yeah. There's another push at 0600. It's four hours. All right. I'll wake you. Before the war, surgeons had been practicing conservative surgery. Instead of removing limbs, they carefully cut away at damaged bone and allowed the limb to heal, so at least the patient didn't lose an arm or a leg. But with such huge numbers of casualties, the dirt, and at first the lack of antiseptics at the front, wounds quickly became septic. And amputations increased dramatically. Many of the official photographs that survive stress the excellence of the medical facilities. But the private written sources offer another view. Nobody can ever imagine the fearful wounds these men have. It is not like one sees on the lovely ambulance train arriving in Southampton with slightly wounded men. If I told you some things that come in here, you would be horrified. And it's just as well that England has not seen yet these remains of what were bright young men brought in to die in a few dreadful hours. The War Office felt the horrors of war had to be kept from the British public. There was a great need to keep up morale at home, to make people feel that the war was going well. There was a highly organised system for dealing with casualties. This plan from 1915 shows how casualties either walked or were carried to field dressing stations. They were then sent by horse, ambulance or foot to casualty clearing stations where doctors decided whether they needed to be sent to hospital or not. This system only broke down when the number of casualties became too great. As part of the system, medical cards were introduced in the First World War. This helped doctors to keep track of a patient's medical history. It was a useful development which carried over into civilian life. Before this, doctors didn't automatically pass on information about how patients had been treated. Now, any doctor who came along could find out what the patient's medical history was without asking the patient for it. It's often said that war leads to new inventions and treatments. Blood banks were developed as a response to war. As war weapons grew more deadly, more soldiers received serious injuries. The pressure of casualties meant that army doctors needed vast amounts of blood to cope with the terrible injuries on the battlefield. Before the war, a blood transfusion was only possible if the donor, the person giving blood, was on the spot. The need to be able to store blood led to the introduction of sodium citrate, which meant that blood could be stored and used without the donor being there. The war also made the search for new antiseptics more important. We had never seen wounds become infected as they did in this soil. They quickly developed gangrene, which meant that the skin became grey and bubbled up. It was made worse as the bullets often carried fragments of dirty cloth into the wounds. The doctors were not expecting this problem. The Boer War, 15 years earlier, had been fought on dry, sandy soil in Africa. But the wet, muddy soil in France meant that the wounds became infected very, very quickly. Carol Dakin's solution was a powerful new antiseptic. 
which helped to clean out the wounds and stop infection spreading. It helped to save many lives and limbs. X-rays were not an innovation of the war. They were invented in 1895, but they were widely used at the front to find bullets and examine injuries. So many more people were trained to use X-rays because of the fighting. One area that made major progress during the war was the diagnosis of mental illness. It affected many thousands of casualties, including a high percentage of officers. For the first time, it was widely recognised. Exposure to the horrors of battle placed terrible stress on soldiers. Shell shock became a major problem, both to the army and to the medical profession. Lawrence Gameson's diary records a typical case. I was searching a shell hole for a body, scratching around. A couple of shells went overhead and I saw them fall near two men from B Company who were working in the open. One man fell and the other was just a boy, really. He escaped and I sent him back to the dugout for my stuff while I held on with the wounded man. And he was hurt quite badly, shrapnel. He'd lost a hand, a lot of blood. Anyway. Later, I thought the incident was closed, but that night I was called out to see the other one, the boy. He's gone. He was all over the shop. I can... I can call him. Shh, 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 shh. Now, this is morphia. It's a rabbit. It's only small. Shh, now, this will help you sleep. So I'm first. Shh, shh, you'll be fine. <laughs> Ryan, his name was. You know, everyone said it was normal. Always up to scratch. Used to seeing people hit. Seeing his friends hit. But this one isolated incident had, had broken him. He just... Nervous disorders had been treated before the war. But the army didn't have much sympathy. They believed to suffer a nervous complaint showed a lack of moral fibre. Army doctors, like all officers, had a duty to keep discipline. So what you seem to be saying is that if there's no blood, there's no wound. Well, I'm saying it somewhat helps a diagnosis, yes. I had a man came in this morning holding his guts, bayonet wound. Now he, I'd say, we should excuse from duty. I think your boy's a coward, Lawrence. I don't know if he's a coward or not. I don't know. All I know is that we've men going over the top every day, and there's something brave. And we're not going to win this war if the whistle blows and boys like him stand skulking on the fire step. It's windy. He had a shock. So, you do your job. You tell him, pull yourself together, and over you go. What about concussion? What about concussion? Oh, bomb goes off. They're clear, just. No blood, no shrapnel, but somehow well, they're knocked off balance. Concussed. Do you think they're fit to fight? Except it's not always as simple as that. And there isn't always a bomb that goes off just at that moment. That's what makes it so difficult. Gunner so-and-so. He's been here for months. He's lived through bombardments, advances, retreats. He's tough as old nails. Takes a machine gun post, single-handed. This man is not windy. And then one day he's, he's standing in the cookhouse and he, he sees a sausage pop on the stove. It looks a bit like flesh. And he starts to cry like a baby. And he doesn't stop crying. I'd like to think that man somehow is wounded. I just don't think any of us understand how. As the war progressed, more and more cases of shell shock were reported. 80,000 cases in all. And it wasn't because of physical wounds. Rather, soldiers and officers alike were being made sick by the surroundings, by the sights, sounds and experiences of trench warfare. The war office was so worried, they tried to limit the damage. In 1917, 
Just before the Battle of Passchendaele, they tried to ban the use of the words shell shock. The medical officer will not record any diagnosis. He will enter the letters NYDN, not yet diagnosed, nervous, and will note any definitely known facts about the true origin or the previous history of the case. In no circumstances whatever will the expression shell shock be used verbally or be recorded. We have to call all our nervous patients either wounded or sick. And all the time there's this pressure to call them sick because only the wounded will get a pension. Our judgment has always been questioned. And you think you're a doctor. It's your job to find out what's wrong. And then some memo comes through and it dawns on you. No, it's not. Your job's to close your eyes and pass them fit for duty. But the war did help the study of mental illness. Because soldiers with nervous disorders were an embarrassment and bad for morale, many were taken away from the front line and kept in special camps. After Passchendaele, one camp was set up holding 5,000 men. Here, though attitudes were basically unsympathetic, some doctors did take the opportunity to study nervous disorders further. As interest grew, specialist hospitals were set up back in Britain. This footage shows victims of shell shock being treated at Netley Hospital in Southampton. The treatments developed here were written up in The Lancet. They included role play, talking and the use of electric shocks to persuade the limbs to work again. Our experience has shown that prolonged re-education is unnecessary and we are now disappointed if complete recovery does not occur within 24 hours. Men are now fit to return to duty or to earn their living in civilian life in a few weeks instead of having to be invalided from the service. The emphasis was still on finding a quick cure and not paying a pension. Many patients with shell shock were accused of malingering or cowardice, the penalty for which could be death. The boy, Ryan, and three days after the incident with the shell, he was himself again, or seemed to be. But then word came down the wire there was to be a push, and the bombardment started again to soften up Jerry before the boys went over the top. And in all the noise and confusion, Ryan just left. He just walked away. The next day, after the push was over, half his mates are dead, he was found five miles behind the line, sitting with his feet in the ditch, holding his rifle like a fishing rod. When asked what he thought he was doing, he said, I'm waiting for a bite. They put him in lockup and charged him with cowardice. Where are we? What do you mean, where are we? He's soft. Tell me. Waiting for Dad. He said when he gets back, we can go to the brook. Do you want to come? Who? Who am I? Who are you talking to? Joe. Who's Joe? Your brother, Joe? Joe. I always go fishing on a Sunday. I'm not your brother. Do you not want to come then? I've seen malingerers. I don't think I'm green. I mean, maybe one or two have slipped past me, I don't know. But this boy was not malingering. No, he didn't know he'd left the battle, left his mates. And now he would be tried, and if found guilty, he could be shot.
Officially, no sentence of death could be carried out without the approval of a medical officer. As the Army Commander-in-Chief, Field Marshal Haig, made clear. When a man has been sentenced to death, if there is any suggestion he is suffering from shell shock, the sentence will not be carried out unless the medical board expresses the positive opinion that he is to be held responsible for his actions. But the official court-martial records show many cases where no medical evidence was taken. This is what Haig said about one plea for mercy on the basis of shell shock. How can we ever win if this plea is allowed? Are you all right? No, no, I'm not actually. What is it? Ryan, sentenced this morning. The Colonel says he's sorry, he knows I was interested in the case, but there wasn't time to call me. But you had the evidence. Was he guilty? Will they... No. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they'll just horsewhip him and bring him back up the line and force him over the next push so he dies a hero. My evidence was all he had. 346 British soldiers were court-martialed and shot for cowardice in the First World War. No medical evidence was called for the last British soldier to be tried for desertion. He was shot on the 7th of November 1918, just four days before the end of the war. So, was the First World War good for medicine? Certainly many civilians were worse off medically. In many hospitals, ordinary patients were sent home to make way for sick and wounded soldiers. Most doctors and nurses were taken out of civilian life and sent to the front, where many of them were also killed, alongside the soldiers they were sent to treat. But the extraordinary demands of the war forced nurses and doctors to find new ways of working on a large scale. It increased the specialist knowledge of doctors because they saw so many similar cases and the lessons learned and the skills acquired benefited civilians after the war. Mm -hmm.